morning. morning. Um, welcome to Cross of Christ Lutheran Church on this Reformation Sunday. We're going to do things a little bit different today. And so we will have a processional. So after I get done with the announcements, then during the opening hymn, we will all rise and we will face the processional cross at the back. And then during that hymn, we will process in following the cross, and then you can see how it goes from there. Uh, the other thing I want you to know about the service is that for the intro it, we are having Psalm 46, and that does not match what's printed on the insert. Uh, the, so at that point, I think you can look at the screen for Psalm 46, that's correct, uh, or your hymnal has all of the psalms in it that we ever sing, including 46 at the very beginning. So either way, Psalm 46 will be the intro it. I picked that one because one, it was one of the options for us and because that is the hymn that inspired Martin Luther to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which we will also be singing today. So, like I said, because of the, we're doing a processional, I'm gonna give all the announcements up front so that when I process out with the cross at the end of the service, I don't have to awkwardly turn around and jog back in and give a bunch of announcements. So we will give all the announcements up front. So the, the ones I want you to know about, uh, on our list of thoughts and prayers, uh, we have, of course, we maintain a good list of those people that are going through adversity that we're praying for, but sometimes somebody comes up with something after we've gone to the press. In this case, uh, Ray Veldman uh, is requesting prayer because he has heart, a heart procedure coming up next week. So we will be keeping him in our prayers as well. Also, if you look over on the Hello October page, you will see, focus on the next weekend part, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, down at the bottom of that schedule, and you're going to see that on Friday at 9 a.m., we have the Lutheran World Relief Caravan park here to be loaded up with all of the quilts that the ladies have made, and those will be donated to flood victims in our region. And so for three hours, we will be the, the ones with the caravan and load it up, and then it proceeds to all sorts of other churches in our area. It looks like I have a further announcement back here. Yeah. Yes. We're looking for people with muscles is the... <laughs> so if you have any of those, show up at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, I'm sorry, 9 a.m. on Friday. So I guess we're looking for retired people with muscles, but anyway. Um, Saturday and... Sunday are chicken barbecue pickup dates. So those are 11 to 4 p.m. on Saturday, November 2nd. Come pick up the barbecue chicken that you ordered. Or on Sunday from 11 to 2 is the other day to pick up the chickens that you ordered. Which means that if you look at the bottom of the page in that bottom paragraph, that Monday, October 28th, that's tomorrow, is the very last day to sign up for a chicken. So if you haven't done it yet, if you like waiting to the last minute, congratulations. You have succeeded. It is now the last minute. So get those uh, signed up if you need them. Also, next weekend will be All Saints Day, another high festival of the church. So we'll probably do something a little bit like I'm doing today. We'll see. Unless we have a big catastrophe with the procession, and then, I'll, then it might be a year or two before I try it again. But I don't think that's going to happen. Now, Sylvia has an announcement for us as well.
Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Because this is your only chance for announcements today. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Patty. I'm going to plug LW Mill again. Yesterday we had our fall rally at Good Shepherd, and we <coughs> ate from our church, which was a very good turnout. It was a very nice uh, morning. And if you look in your bulletin, it, we're going to have a beaded tournament workshop. Uh, it's free, uh, free, free, free. And it is appropriate. I mean, it's just the, the it's little beads, but little girls can do it too, so it's not just uh, for old ladies. Um, and there's a sign up outside the library, and that's really just so that I have some kind of idea of how many are going to show. It's not required, but it's November the 7th at 6 o'clock downstairs. Thank you. All right, with that, we will go to our opening hymn. I recommend you pick up your hymnals because I will be asking you to turn and face the processional cross at the rear of the church, making it difficult to see the screens. So page 566 in your hymnals. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though its waters roar and foam. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He his voice, the, earth melts. the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Uh, he, has brought desolations on the earth. he makes wars cease to the end of the earth. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. is written in Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading this morning is written in Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is Reformation Sunday where we commemorate the event in 1517 when Dr. Martin Luther, a professor of theology at Wittenberg University, unknowingly kicked off the Reformation. And of course, that was the huge upheaval in the church that re-centralized the gospel of Jesus Christ into the very center of the church. And he did that by posting a document on the doors of the castle church in his hometown. And that was the typical way to initiate a scholarly debate in those days. Now this document, it criticized some of the practices and the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And we recall that there was no separation of church and state in those days, so this was a document that criticized the government and the church. Now, Luther wrote the 95 Theses document because he was convinced that the truth matters and that Holy Scripture is the ultimate source of truth. If anything contradicts Scripture, then it's not true. And that concept became known in Latin as sola scriptura, sola scriptura, which is a fancy way of saying by scripture alone. And that, of course, became one of the pillars of the Reformation, along with the concepts concerning salvation by grace alone and through faith alone, so the solas. Of course, I'm getting way, way ahead of myself now. The truth matters. It is dangerous to live according to false doctrines. And this is something that Martin Luther understood very well. So let's look at Martin Luther. He was born in 1483 in Saxony, a place that we would call Germany nowadays, but it was Saxony in those days. And in 1505, at the age of, of 22, after a series of events, he decided to go into church work, and he became a friar. Now, we often say monk, but technically a monk goes and lives in a monastery away from all the people and the friars. They were monk-ish, but they lived in chapter houses in a town, and they interacted with people. Sometimes they taught lessons and such. So he was a friar. And as a very young friar, Luther was terrified that God hated him for his sins. And he, he ended up hating God himself right back, as he imagined it. And so he spent a lot of time trying to punish himself for his sins. He would literally whip himself in his little cell, and he would confess his sins constantly and put himself through all kinds of difficult things, sleeping without a blanket. He was physically punishing himself, trying to appease God by beating himself up for his own sins. But as a result, he was driven to spiritual despair because he was a slave to his sins. But he was also a slave to false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church because they had taught him that his own good works and his own holy living and beating himself up, that those things could free him from sin and future punishment for those sins. But they also taught him that you could never know if you had obtained that freedom from sin. You could never know with certainty. He could never know if he had done enough. The secret is we can't do enough. What does the scripture teach us? The Son of God truly frees us from sin. So while Luther was a friar and going through all these difficult times spiritually, he had uh, his, his superior at the Augustinian chapter house where he lived. His superior was named John Staupitz. And Staupitz had become weary of Martin Luther's constant introspection and constant self-loathing and, and frankly, the constant number of times a day he showed up to John Staupitz to confess sin. So he ordered Martin Luther to attend Bible school. I mean, it seems like a good idea, right? You're a church worker. <laughs> but uh, that wasn't actually a prerequisite back then. So he sends him to Bible school. And it was in the hopes that this would focus Martin Luther's mind outside of himself. Well, this was huge. This was huge for Martin Luther. He was a brilliant Bible stu student. Brilliant. And he went along that path so far that ultimately he earned a doctorate in theology in 1512. And then he became a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. And all of that diligent study of scripture revealed to him the gospel truth. 
No one is saved by their own efforts. No one. From our epistle lesson today. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Now how is that good news? The epistle lesson just taught us that your mouth is stopped. That means that you have no possible response, no defense, no excuse, no retort for why you have not kept the law. You have no defense for failing to follow God's law. You and the whole world are under the law and are accountable to the lawgiver. All the commandments that you read in the Bible, they highlight to you how much you do not keep them, that you can't keep them. And there is absolutely nothing you can say to justify yourself. Nothing. And you know this in your heart. You know it. You sin on purpose. And you secretly want to keep on sinning. So you have no excuse. Your mouth is stopped. And you are accountable to God. So we are crushed by these lawful truths recorded in Romans chapter 3. But this is not the final word on justification or righteousness in this passage. We cannot justify ourselves, so Jesus does that for us. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Christ Jesus, we are justified by his grace as a gift. We are not justified by our good actions and certainly not by any great excuse we may come up for why we sin. We are justified, and that means saved, by grace through faith. That is the Reformation gospel truth in a nutshell. Justified, saved, by grace through faith. And grace means unmerited favor, favor that you didn't earn or we're not worthy of. We don't earn salvation, and we certainly don't buy it, and we will come to that later in the lesson today. We don't buy it. We are, we are, and it's not even that you were partially good, and then God looked down and saw a partially good person, and he helps them the rest of the way. That's not how it works either. This, a salvation that Jesus Christ accomplished for us is totally one-sided, absolutely one-sided. Salvation is a pure gift of God, which he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. Now we receive this good news of salvation by hearing the word of God, like you are doing right now. It is by hearing his word that God sends you his Holy Spirit, who enlivens you and gives you faith in Jesus Christ. Now did you catch that? Even your faith in Jesus is a gift from God. When you believe in Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins and you trust him as your Lord and Savior, even that faith comes from the Holy Spirit working in you. All of salvation thus is to God be the glory, not to us, to God be the glory. So you are justified. You are saved from sin, death, and the devil. And you are declared righteous in God's eyes for the sake of Jesus' bloody death on the cross. You cannot justify yourself. Your mouth is stopped. So out of sheer mercy and love for his creation, Jesus came down from heaven and died on the cross and makes you righteous. Back in Martin Luther's day, 
the Roman Catholic Church was engaged in selling forgiveness, selling indulgences. Now, an indulgence was a little slip of paper, like a receipt. And that receipt guaranteed forgiveness of sins and escape from the punishment of those sins in exchange for a fee. You just bought it. It's a vile false doctrine. And the truth that Martin Luther learned from reading the scriptures, well, it completely undermines the blasphemous practice of buying an indulgence. And that is the catalyst, the reason he wrote the 95 Theses document were these indulgences. That was the main thing that he wanted to have a scholarly, scriptural debate about. As it turned out, Rome did not want a debate. A lot of money was flowing to powerful men within the Roman Catholic hierarchy. They wanted to keep it that way. Because if the regular people found out that God's forgiveness is always a free gift, well, they would stop buying it, right? So the whole thing is a diabolical scheme. And I mean that it's satanic. It's diabolical, it's satanic. The Roman Catholic Church taught that you needed to do good works to earn your salvation. Then they taught that you cannot be sure if you had done enough. So at death, if you hadn't done enough, you could spend centuries in torment in a place called purgatory that doesn't exist, by the way. But get this, the Pope could sell you a get-out-of-purgatory card for money. You could buy that for yourself, or you could buy it for a dead relative. And it got so bad that they didn't have a set price for these things. It was basically a matter of a traveler from the Pope showed up in your town, and he basically said, how much money do you have? Oh, that's what the thing costs. <laughs> so, so you could, And then you'd have this useless piece of paper. But the problem is this, this piece of paper was a tangible item. You could point to it. You could see it. And so it felt certain. You had this absolutely false certainty that you were heaven bound. That makes it a blasphemous anti-sacrament. Because this slip of paper was not backed up by the word of God. It did not have God's promises attached to it for the forgiveness of sins. It was a lie. There was no truth in it, no matter how many popes defended the practice. So in his 95 Theses document, Martin Luther wrote this. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt even without indulgence letters. That's the truth. You don't need a letter from the Pope or anybody else that says that your sins are forgiven. Christ has accomplished that for you already. And if you're a Christian, that means that you're forgiven already. He also wrote this. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teacher. Now, that is the truth, and it's a hard truth, right? It's, it's a loud truth, <laughs> and that truth got Martin Luther in a lot of trouble with the most powerful men on earth. Four years after posting his 95 Theses, so in 1521, Luther was summoned to a special assembly held by Emperor Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, most powerful man on earth probably, along with representatives from the Pope, Pope probably the second most powerful man on, earth, man on earth, and they were there at this assembly and they had summoned Luther. Now Luther, for his part, was hoping that he was about to get that scholarly scriptural debate for which he ever posted the 95 Theses document in the first place. He thought he was finally going to be in a debate. But sadly, and probably very bitterly to Martin Luther, I imagine, that is not what happened at all. He marched into that assembly with the emperor and the pope's representative and a huge crowd of people. And there was a table in the midst of that assembly. And on it were all of the truth-filled books that Martin Luther had written so far. And when he got there, the pope's representative simply pointed at that pile of truth-filled books and said, recant. They asked him to recant. Take it all back. Tell a convenient lie and unsay the truth 
and you can go free. But Martin Luther was already free. Martin Luther was already free. The truth had set him free. And he knew that only the truth can really set you free. Jesus said in our gospel reading, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth had already set Martin Luther free. So he was ready to die for the truth. He's already free. So he said, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of sacred scripture, or by evident reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, and I will not recant anything. God help me. Amen. The truth matters. And Martin Luther stood on the truth even when the whole world was against him. The result of that assembly is that Emperor Charles V declared Martin Luther an outlaw, and it banned all his books. They could be burned at will. In essence, there was a valid arrest warrant hanging over Martin Luther's head for the rest of his life. He was an outlaw. Anybody in the empire could enforce the punishment on Martin Luther, even kill him, and it would not be counted against them. It was legal to bring action against Martin Luther in the entire empire, and it hung over his head for the rest of his life. Now, if you know some of the details, there were other powerful men, political figures, that protected Martin Luther. But what was the truth that Martin Luther was willing to stand on? He was willing to stake his earthly life and his eternal soul on. What was that truth? That we are saved by grace. Through faith in Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. God's forgiveness is a pure gift. You can't earn it. You certainly cannot buy it. Jesus already accomplished our salvation for us, and he saves us out of pure mercy and love. And then in addition, Christ gave us real sacraments, tangible external things that you can see and feel and smell and taste, so that in faith we are certain that God has forgiven our sins, regardless of what we happen to feel any given moment. Sometimes we may not feel forgiven. We can point to our baptism. We can point to the holy sacrament of the altar. And we can point to the word of God. And we can know for certain. We do know for certain that we are forgiven. We believe in the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the further truth is this. Jesus has redeemed you. A lost and condemned person purchased and won you from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. This is most certainly true. So here we stand. We cannot do otherwise. So help us, God. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the truth. Amen. Please stand and we will confess our faith by singing the creedal hymn, We All Believe in One True God, on page 954 of your hymnals.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we give thanks and praise for all your goodness and tender care, especially on this Reformation Festival. Thank you for the gift of your Son and for the revelation of your will and grace. Implant your word in us and give us fertile hearts to keep it and bring forth its good fruit in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, keep us steadfast in your word and prevent our wayward hearts from following false gospels that lead us away from you. Provide your church with faithful pastors who preach in purity and joy that we are saved by your grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, you have great power and yet you act with mercy. Teach those who lead us to use power rightly for the preservation of order, the accomplishment of justice, the protection of life, and the defense of the weak. Give us wise, godly, and faithful leaders who will follow your commands and serve with integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, remember all who face adversity of any kind, especially Cameron, Frank, Evelyn, Linda, Dawn, Anne, Jerry, Elaine, Jim, and Ray. Use their circumstances to further spread your gospel and comfort them by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have given us the certainty of sins forgiven in your Son, set forth as the propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So lead us to eat and drink your holy body and precious blood in repentance and faith, now and always, Lord, in your mercy. Preserve your church, O Lord, in each of us as members of Christ's body, that we may not surrender the true gospel for any reason, but be kept in this faith and fear throughout the days of our earthly pilgrimage, until that day when we and all your people shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the reward you have prepared for us, and all who have loved his appearing. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the offering.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive Renew and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, to you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
given into death for all your sins. Take it. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Welcome to the Lord's table. Taking this is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into
Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Oh.